is an engineering problem, my friend. Really. Okay, is that better? Okay, slightly better. I'll speak quickly. So what we're doing at UCT here is offering a huge variety of summer school courses. I'm sure you've spent many hours perusing this fantastic brochure and fantasizing about all the education and all the lectures you can attend. UCT is very proud of its summer school, very proud of the variety of courses, but also the amazing quality of the courses that are offered. And of course, not only the quality of the courses, but the quality of the presenters of the courses. And I've introduced a couple, and we have amazingly eminent presenters who are willing to come and participate in our summer school. So today I'd like to introduce Tony Murray, who's a retired civil engineer who's developed an interest in local engineering history. He's written extensively and presented numerous lectures on various aspects of the civil engineering profession. And it's a fantastic course, I can see that you're presenting in a series of lectures about the most romantic of topics, and that's lighthouses. So it gives me the greatest of pleasure. running and uh, so thank you very much Professor no I'm going to get held back again thank you very much Professor Lewis um, why this series of lectures why the lectures that I've given in previous years well it was mainly to try and interest young people to come and join her faculty and study there and uh, get them interested in civil engineering. And we tell them all about the way civil engineers make bridges and dams and uh, railways. We don't make railways much anymore, but... Uh so, well, tell me whether it's any good or not, Joe. Yeah? Uh, any better? You see. This is what the trouble is. Okay, try again. Hopefully it will stay this way. Uh, and we went through all these different disciplines of, of civil engineering. There are about 18 in all, and they're growing all the time. Until I realized that, the, that one of the most exciting and innovative and dangerous uh, and glamorous branches of the profession had been left out entirely because, uh, sadly, civil engineers don't do much about lighthouses anymore. Can you hear me if I, if I don't have a... and uh, how they've developed over the years. And I hope you'll join me in believing us, as I said, they're romantic, they're an exciting part of, of the profession, and they're picturesque too, which uh, I hope you'll really agree as we uh, finish the, the, uh, the course. Um, so it seemed a, a nice little start to uh, call it lead kindly light. Uh, I don't know if the... Uh, the good cardinal, the bad archbishop, depending on the point of view, or it was thinking of lighthouses when he wrote this hymn, but it seemed very appropriate. And uh, many seafarers of us have thought in these sort of terms as they've seen lighthouses over the years. So let's get on with lighthouses and begin at the very beginning, which is a good place to begin, as they say, and uh, talk about some ancient lights. And the grand area of them all, and the first lighthouse of any consequence at all, was the famed Pharos at Alexandria uh, in Egypt. Alexandria was founded by Alexander the Great, 
And when he died, his generals divided the booty, and one called Ptolemy gained Alexandria. And uh, he needed to put this place on the map. Now, the picture you see there is rather strange because uh, there are no large mountains uh, in Alexandria, uh, and there are no Gothic spires like you see here. So whoever was doing this was rather fanciful. But it didn't matter. Um, Ptolemy wanted to put this new trading town that he was building on the map. It was very well situated, and uh, he needed to get the seafarers there. So he thought he'd put up some sort of beacon to show the people where it was. So this is a unique lighthouse, because it wasn't built to warn people away. It was built as a sort of BC neon sign. This is the Alexandria Mall. Come here, do your shopping, buy all the goodies from the Far East and the Spice Street that have been uh, gathered here. So, as I say, it's a fanciful picture, but it is true and it is correct that it was on an island, this great, uh, this great structure, and it was joined to the mainland by a causeway, which uh, was very true. But the German scholars, that have uh, come in since have decided it was something that looked like this. Um, it was about 140 meters high, which is uh, pretty high. And in fact, uh, the tallest structure ever inhabited and ever had a roof on from the time it was built in uh, BC. 200 and something, until the American skyscrapers overtook it, uh, even though it, it, it was destroyed by the earthquake in 1902. It was built by a man called Sostratus, who Ptolemy brought in, Ptolemy II brought in to uh, do the job, and he built this out of Nubian granite, a large, tall, square building with a tower on the top, at the very top, a statue of Poseidon, and somewhere in here a fire, which they say was reinforced by mirrors supplied by Archimedes. It was visible from 40 miles out. Now, Sostatus, the engineer, was an interesting engineer because he wanted to have his name remembered. And so he carved into the rock here somewhere uh, this building was built by Sostatus for the benefit of all mariners and the gods of safety. Which is a rather silly thing to do, perhaps, because Ptolemy was the guy who was the, the king and wanted to praise. So Sostatus, having done this, plastered it over with lime plaster and put in it, this building was erected by Ptolemy. <laughs> but Ptolemy was very happy. And Sostatus, well, by the time he was gone and Ptolemy was gone, the line across the fell away, and for the next 1,300 years, uh, Sostatus' name was properly inscribed and lasted on into the building. Uh, this was the, the Omanus, and of course, one of the seven wonders of the world, and uh, it lasted until it was destroyed by an earthquake, the second oldest of the seven wonders of the world, of course, the pyramids are still standing. Uh, the Romans built several lighthouses, and this one at Dover Castle uh, is the remains of one which was put up on the other side of the channel to impress the legionnaires uh, camping in Gaul that if they crossed the channel, there'd be something on the other side. There was a fire lit on the top of it, and uh, tended by the Roman soldiers on the grounds of uh, in, in, on the top of, of the cliffs of Dover. In the grounds of, of Dover Castle, incidentally, which is a military castle, not a feudal castle, and well worth a, a visit if you're in that part of the world. Uh, also particularly interesting about it is underneath the castle, in the White Cliffs, are a series of tunnels built for the protection of England in case of invasion. Not in recent times, but in Napoleonic times. But uh, in this last war, an entire uh, war cabinet set up was uh, put into the, these tunnels, 
that is there today as a museum. In case there was an invasion, the, uh, the attempts to repel the invasion would have been directed from the tunnels under the Dover Castle. The main reason for that was to persuade the, the Roman legionnaires, though, that there was life on the other side of the channel. Now, the Romans built something like 40 uh, lighthouses in the time that were still operating at the, at the Empire declined. And this is one of the best studies in the Tower of Hercules at Corona. The story is that the uh, Hercules knew the giant Gerion and buried his head on the spot of this light where the lighthouse was built. And Hercules then in order that the head would be buried there and a town and a tower should be built on the spot where it is today. The other story about it is King Briogan, who was the founding father of the Galician uh, Celtic nation, built a tower there before this one. Uh, his sons climbed at this very tall tower, and they saw in the distance to the north a green and pleasant land. And uh, they got in their boats and sailed there, and so founded the Irish Celtic nation and the spinoffs from that in Scotland and Wales and Cornwall. So this is the oldest Roman lighthouse still in service. Uh, it was rather difficult to get up in previous times uh, because you had to sort of slide up a gutter. And how they got the fuel to uh, keep the lamp burning, I, I, I really wouldn't know. <coughs> if you've been on one of the cruises to St. Petersburg, you might have passed this lighthouse on the Isle of Hiyumaha. Well, I wouldn't try to really uh, pronounce it properly, which is uh, where you turn right in the Baltic Sea to go into the Gulf of Finland and onto St. Petersburg. And it's a tourist attraction today. It's probably the oldest lighthouse in the, in the world that is still operating. Uh, it was built because on that turning point there, there was this nasty island, and uh, ships were inclined to found it there. And so the Hanseatic League uh, made advances to the Bishop of Tallinn to do something about it. And the Lighthouse was built way back in 1531. It had a wood fire on the top of it. It consumed 100 cords of wood each year. I don't know how much a cord was, but it was a lot because it led to the deforestation of the entire Kufu Peninsula. And uh, I said it was still alive. It isn't actually. It's been out of commission for about 20 years now because it's been replaced by a radar lighthouse. <laughs> One of the most famous was at the port of Genoa, built in 1138, uh, because Genoa was one of the two great ports of that point of the world, Italy and uh, Genoa and Venice, and they built this very tall tower there with a uh, day mark, as they call them, a cross on it to show that this was Genoa. Now, we'll come across day marks later on where lighthouses need to be identified, and uh, this was one of the first day marks. Uh, a beautiful lighthouse, very much in operation today. And um, one of the first keepers was one Antonio Colombo, who I don't think was a relation of the American detective, but he certainly was the uncle of Christopher Columbus. And uh, the lighthouse is the fifth tallest in the world today. Now, the French were very keen on lighthouses, and uh, they had a particular problem at the mouth of the Giron because it was a very busy river, because Bordeaux was just at the end of the estuary, and there was a tremendous trade from early days in, uh, in wine. And many, many ships found it on a nasty shoal at the front of the, of the estuary, at the mouth of the estuary. Um, a lot of the, the trade that came there was from Ireland, because Ireland was the halfway point to uh, getting wine to England, 
And the Irish traders, many of them settled in Bordeaux, they would apply uh, their trade from there by Ireland. If you want to know more about it, go to get any uh, wine estate where the whole story is, is, uh, is spelt out because Madame who owns Gennelli has Irish ancestors in uh, As early as the 11th century, then, the situation was so bad with this rock that caused uh, wrecks that mariners refused to enter the river unless a marker was set up to guide them. So Edward the Black Prince built a 40-foot tower and he put a hermit in to live on the rock and tend to the tower, and he imposed the first tax on ships passing by to uh, pay for his lighter. Well, this wasn't good enough, this tower with a, with a fire on the top of it. So in 1581, Henry III of France decided to build a new lighthouse, and he commissioned the renowned architect called Louis de Foy to design it. And he gave him a free hand, and de Foy went to town. And he came up with a magnificent structure which would reflect the glory of France and function as a beacon, and a church, and a royal residence, and a fortress. So here it is here, the ground floor is a circular tower consisting of four residences for the keepers. Uh, in the center, a richly decorated entrance hall, 22 foot square and 20 feet high, leading to the second story, which was the king's apartment. And this was a drawing room, an ante room, a number of small bedrooms, uh, lavishly decorated, more like a honeymoon suite than a lighthouse keeper's uh, apartment. And above that, I kid you not, was a chapel with a dome roof, uh, stained glass windows, and lots of icons, really uh, as good a cathedral as you'd be dealing with. And only above that did he have the uh, watchtower and the secondary lantern and the very uh, major lantern on the top here. And I presume this thing here is the stairway or whatever was needed to uh, let the, the keepers bypass the king's apartment where he was no doubt uh, ensconced with his lady love. <coughs> Sailors criticized the lack of height of the light that Defoy had uh, designed. And so in 1782, an engineer called Joseph Tenure enveloped the top floors in a conventional tower, uh, retained the ground floor, the two floors above it, which was the, the working part, and uh, the Renaissance decoration were retained in the king's apartment. But uh, unfortunately, the magnificent lines of the old building uh, were destroyed. But uh, at 68 meters, it's the 10th tallest lighthouse in the world. It's still doing its job. Sometimes when SAA fly over um, towards the, the, the Bay of Biscay, you can see this if you're on the left-hand side of the plane and near a window, and it's uh, the right time of the year when the sun is shining, but you can see this, this uh, huge lighthouse from 28,000 feet. And here you can see how it was built. Uh, and the, the various floors as it was rebuilt. The French loved this lighthouse. The French had a very good rapport with the lighthouse keepers, the government, the funders, and the scientists. And whenever a new innovation came along, uh, they installed it in this lighthouse, first of all. So the first fancy optics, which you'll learn more about later, were installed in the Rock of Cadua. Now, in England, which had a very difficult coast and lots and lots of nasty rocks and lots and lots of nasty peninsulas and points. Uh, very little was done about lighthouses because the English didn't tell us about the whole thing. They said, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, if sailors drown, too bad. If ships get wrecked, too bad. Uh, 
if the merchants don't like their cargoes going astray, they must do something about it. It wasn't the state's job to look after the, the safety of mariners. Well, well, Henry VIII, who we probably know is a bad king, but he had some good points about him. And uh, he could foresee that there were wars coming up. And so he formalized the formation of the British Navy. And he constituted a board of the Admiralty uh, in 1512. And at the same time, he empowered a guild in honor of the Holy Trinity and St. Clement in the Church of Deptford Strong for the reformation of the Navy, lately much decayed by the admission of young men without experience. And so they were finding troubles with that in those days already. Uh, what this organization was called, uh, it turned out to be a board of technical experts to advise on matters of ships and seamanship and navigation. It called itself the Brotherhood of the Most Glorious and Undivided Trinity, and we know today as Trinity House. Well, Trinity House, again, didn't take any direct interest in lighthouses. It concentrated on looking after widows and orphans. It concentrated on training people for the sea. It, trained, um, it, it um, also had the power to grant the tolls and collect the tolls for people passing lighthouses, but it didn't actually build or administer the lighthouses itself. So they continued to concentrate on charitable and educational works. And the most famous uh, master of Trinity House was old Samuel Pepys, who wasn't terribly impressed with his colleagues. He called them a bunch of old soakers, lazy, corrupt, doting rogues. I found them reading their charter, which they did like fools, only reading here and there a bit, whereas they ought to do it all, every word. And uh, that's the constitution today, I guess. <laughs> so some private lighthouses were not purely altruistic, as these private lighthouses came up because uh, landowners felt that they should do something about it, and there was now a mechanism for gathering some dues from the ships as they passed. So at Small's Light, the first of Wales, the expenditure was five pound per annum for the rent of the rock, about 120 pounds per annum for wages for the two keepers, and whatever the cost of fuel was. And the returns per annum were 22,000 pounds. Well, that's a pretty good business by any standards. And no wonder more and more of these lighthouses uh, grew up uh, around the, the, the coast there. Um, the owner of the scariest light, that's this one here, we turn right for Liverpool as you pass to Wales, uh, held out for compensation when it was eventually taken over by Trinity House, and he got £444,000 for it in about 1840, which was an awful lot of money. So Lighthouse became a business as much as uh, an altruistic job. Here's a picture of the sort of thing that you had to pay before you left Liverpool in the, uh, this particular steamer had to pay, or what is it, steamer? Whatever, ship had to pay two pounds, of which 10 shillings went to the Scaries Lighthouse, and 10 shillings to Dungeness, and 10 shillings to Forlands, and various other amounts to the other lighthouses along the way as he sailed from Liverpool, left back before he left Liverpool uh, for the lighthouse's dues along the way until he got to London. <coughs> now, in the early days, typically there was a penny per tonne of cargo per, per lighthouse. Uh, nowadays, you still pay dues, it's ranged between uh, 10p and uh, a pound per tonne of, uh, of cargo that you have on board, and you're still paying it. So, in 1836, a bill was passed making it compulsory for all lighthouses to be taken over by Trinity House. 
Um, Trinity Pass then had to do something about building lighthouses, so they <coughs> employed a very well-known civil engineer at the time called James Walker, who uh, built the West India docks and the Surrey docks, around where all the activity is in London these days, the Mary Wharf. And uh, he also was the structural engineer for Big Ben. And he built lighthouses at Stark Point and Bishop Rock and Wolf Rock and Eagles, and uh, made a great improvement to some of the roster spots along the Danish uh, coast. And when he died, the job was taken over by Sir James Douglas, and he built many other lighthouses, which we'll talk about later in the course. Well, okay, let's get on to the nitty-gritty of the course and the elements of design and uh, what you need to know about a lighthouse is a theoretical part of it. So, over the course of time, the principles of design of the actual uh, building itself for wave swept lighthouses uh, came into being. The center of gravity of this structure should be as low as possible. Uh, the mass at any point should be enough to prevent sideways displacement. In other words, if a, if a wave came and it bashed into it here somewhere, it shouldn't move sideways. The weight of this would prevent it from moving uh, along the plane there. The uh, circular section on the middle there would, prevent, would, would offer least resistance <coughs> to the elements. And there should be a cylindrical base where the waves were strongest to uh, resist the horizontal thrust. But as you went up there, you had a curve in the, to deflect the waves upwards. Uh, the outer surface, surface should be as smooth as possible, which wasn't originally thought necessary, as we discovered. And uh, the height should be sufficient to keep the lantern above the water in spray. <laughs> Uh, although many lighthouses were built, presuming this was the case, they uh, weren't always that lucky, and you find that the waves actually used to overtop the lighthouse itself. Well, as I was saying, lighthouses are not only needed at night to keep people away from rocks, but they're for navigation purposes during the day. And so it became very important to distinguish between the lighthouses on the coast because you didn't know which one was which if you were sailing past. So they started putting them in livery. And uh, here are a few examples from uh, South African lighthouses and gave colors so that you know where you are, that you're at Grunner Fiamont and not at Green Point. The early beacons, the early lights were simply fires, burning wood at first, then coal when it became available. Uh, the light wasn't very intense, it was very often shrouded in smoke, and if the light was enclosed at all, then soot was soon covered in the glass panes. And the keepers were kept very busy cleaning when they weren't lugging fuel up the tower. Now, in this particular lighthouse in, in the Firth and Fourth, uh, they did have some sort of crane to get the coal to the top of the lighthouse, but it still was back-breaking work. And uh, when they had a crane to help them, they they might they, they, they still had to to lift this thing up through uh, several feet, as in the case of this lighthouse. So they had in the Baltic states this likely looking instrument, a sort of a crane with a bucket on the end of it with fire. Um, and it wasn't much use because the people working it got showered with uh, soot and burning cinders, and so they gave this particular one up too. So they moved on from fires to candles, and um, at the Ediston, Smeaton had 24 candles, uh, and a timepiece alongside it was very necessary to alert the lighthouse keeper of the need to replace the expired candles. Uh, 
These 24 candles could be seen not very far away, but they weren't depicted as we then later. But there were still problems with soot and the fact that candles burnt down, the focal plane uh, changed. So candles were obviously not going to be much use at all. So they thought about concentrating the light somehow or other in the first place. And they thought about putting mirrors behind the <coughs> flame where the light wasn't needed. Putting a flat mirror was no good at all because it just dispersed the light with the best. So they came up with parabolic reflectors made of copper. Now, how do you make a cone with an uh, accurate three-dimensional interior surface? And then, how do you make it reflective? So there were many efforts to do this. And for instance, a, a, a chap called Tom Smith, who was the grandfather of the Scottish lighthouse industry, he plastered his copper cone with little bits of reflective uh, silver and, and so managed to get a cone which uh, concentrated the beam a bit. But still, the beam wasn't really effective if it was camped. Well, there was an interesting mark. One of these multi-talented people in uh, Switzerland at the time, uh, Francois Amy Agan, who uh, he was a, a, a juvenile delinquent, perhaps. He, he was into distilling brandy at the age of 15 <laughs> and carried on making improvements to this method over the years. And the story goes that working on uh, with, his, with his distillery, he had a broken flask, which he put over the very poor lamp by which he was working. And immediately, the flame flared up and was four times as bright as it had been before the chimney thing was put over. So, Argon was very good at patents and such like, and uh, he saw the opportunity now to make something useful. But first of all, he had to make, uh, find out the, the, the light dimensions for the chimney. And he had to find out glass which wouldn't crack under the heat. So he had to go to the glass makers in France who were pretty on the ball. And he designed the chimney that way. But having done that, he realized that the wick itself, which was a flat wick before he got involved, uh, needed this oxygen, and why the whole thing was improving with this chimney was because it was more better flow of air and better flow of oxygen. <coughs> so he made the circular wicks, which uh, he needed to find out how to make. So he went to a lace maker, and they made this thing that looked like a sock, which uh, became the wick. And then, let me take on out a patent on that. How do you get the wick to be raised and lowered when you've got a chimney around it? And so he had to perfect some sort of raising and lowering mechanism. Again, a patent. Again, he made money out of it. And so he was soon marketing these lamps in France, where they were readily accepted as a vast improvement on the candles. But he went further than that. He went across the channel and he got hold of James Watt and his partner, Matthew Bolton, and they started turning up our game lamps in the Birmingham factory, and uh, of course not just for lighthouses, but for domestic use, great advance in lighting at night uh, from the Argo and lamps. And of course the uh, lighthouse people were very interested in this lamp, and Tom Smith uh, modified it so that it could fit into his So it can fit into his parabolic reflector with a, with a uh, here's, here's the lamp, here's the reflector. This was the only problem that Argand had, that he had only whale oil to work with, and so it was very uh, viscous stuff, and it didn't flow very easily into the wick. So it had to flow by 
gravity of the stage until he invented a pump for it. And then everything was fine. And after that, of course, they moved on from Wayne World to Kerosene Currently and so on. Well, Tom Smith and his compatriots uh, in, uh, in Scotland saw a better chance now because they were worried about this business of identifying lighthouses. And you can imagine if you, you're, you're coming on a ship across the Atlantic and uh, you haven't seen the sun for a fortnight and such like, and you suddenly see a lighter heading in the world. Where is it? Cape Finisterre or the Skerry 4 or Land's End or wherever it is? You need to be able to identify the lights. So they put these uh, lamps on rotating reflectors in groups and the, the whole uh, assembly rotated slightly or slowly every, uh, every minute or so and the flashes appeared to come out every 20 seconds or so for the one lighthouse, every 30 seconds for the other lighthouse and in groups of two for certain lighthouse and people could then from their manuals know where they were, which lighthouse they were looking at. <coughs> James Douglas, who we spoke about a little earlier, was not only a lighthouse builder, but a, a researcher as well. And he came up with this tremendous bird. There were seven wicks, which uh, could be seen 22 miles away. Well, it still didn't mean that the poor old lighthouse keeper could uh, relax. And there was an enormous amount of cleaning to be done uh, lifting the weights which made these uh, machines uh, rotate, these assemblies rotate. They were whipped like a cuckoo clock, the, the weights lowered slightly, and then you had to, every two or three hours, you had to wind up the weight again. And uh, carrying fuel and so on, they were very busy people at night time as well as the day. Now, another interesting character was a man called Kitson, who, when kerosene, when paraffin became the regular thing, realized that it worked much better if it was vaporized. And so he invented a pump to vaporize the, uh, the, the paraffin before it was burnt, and then he contained the vapor in a mantle. So the mantle, like the vaporizing oil burner, which uh, we used to know quite well, and probably still do if you go camping alone, they have these uh, lamps. But um, they were invented by Mr. Kitson, who found that lamps could produce three times the light of an ordinary lamp for the same amount of fuel. Kitson was an interesting character. He was forever writing to the times. He was a military theorist. He was <coughs> well in the moment, I think. Uh, a pamphlet, uh, and he got very hot into the collar about uh, the military system in England at the time. It didn't do much good because his company went poker. <coughs> Another interesting person was Niels Garland, who was the chief engineer of the Gas Accumulator Company in Stockholm. And uh, he was experimenting with acetylene, which was a very nice fuel, but he found a way to have a valve which worked only at night and switched itself off in the daytime, much the same as some of these lamps now that we have with the magic eye that uh, only come on at night. Uh, but this was a, uh, a, 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 a pin lamp which was very useful for the uh, floating buoys and such like when you didn't have an attendant lighthouse. So, the, the very bright light of acetylene was very really useful, and some of the major lighthouses also moved to acetylene. Gordon <coughs> was an interesting chap. He got the Nobel Prize for this particular invention. Uh, he carried on experimenting, and before he actually could receive the, the Nobel Prize, he blinded himself in an accident with his acetylene. Then he can, carried on with, and he became the managing director of this company, which now was called the Akti Bogalat Gas Accumulator Company. And they made a large variety of products. Akti, all the rest of it, initials AGA. So if you remember 
your mothers or your grandmothers large stove called an Arga stove. It was invented by Mr. Darling. <coughs> he had a hundred other patents as well, so he was a very productive fellow. Now, on the other side of the story was what do we do about the concentrating of the light? These parabolic reflectors weren't very really efficient. Now, for years, scientists had been grappling with the nature of light. Um, the English scientists particularly believed that Newton's theory that light was a stream of particles was the way to go. Other scientists looked at it and started thinking about the wave theory because it passed through prisms and it did certain things like that. So this chap called Fresnel uh, was another of these multi-talented scientists. Uh, uh, he's one of the, the 72 names inscribed on the Eiffel Tower, and he's a cousin of Prosper Merimi, the author of Common, so he was well connected. When he started looking at the path of light through prisms, and if you had a circular prism like, like this here, and it was, you had a light source behind it, you could make a concentrated beam go out of that in that fashion there. And he went a bit better than that, and he decided that if you put an annular prism around the edge of it, like that, you could get more light that was going straight into the beam, and so he went on. And these dioptic lenses, as he called it, were very efficient, and became the standard use, and the French immediately put one into quarter one lighthouse, and the uh, that was the, was the standard program there onwards. Well, Mr. Mr. Fresnel, uh, if you've been linked with the theatre at all, uh, his invention was put to other uses. And the standard spotlight in the theatre uh, 25 years ago, and they're still in the back side of the last night. Maybe Fresnel's spotlights with a soft edge uh, been going for a years or so, ever since electricity was used in the theatres. Now, on the other side of the channel, there was a Scottish physicist, inventor, mathematician, astronomer, historian, university principal, who was also concerned with light and the nature of it. Uh, he again believed in the wave theory and people didn't believe him. The scientists at Cambridge were wedded to Newton. So he wasn't <coughs> taken seriously by the establishment and he wasn't taken seriously by the British government. The British government and the British system was poor compared with France. There they had very good rapport between the uh, government, the lighthouse owners, and the lens makers and the scientists. And things got happened very well there. In England, the, the academics didn't talk to the government, and they didn't talk to the lens makers and business makers, or the lighthouse makers. Brewster railed against this. He got very upset. He was a crusty old man. And uh, he had already described this dioptic lens that we saw just now, before Fresnel even got around, but he never actually made one. Um, but he did other things as well. He invented the stereoscope, which allows you to see photographs in the parapet of the dimension. And then he made a lot of money with a very useful invention. He invented the kaleidoscope in 1815. And he was tremendously successful. successful. The, uh, the rage of Europe and the Americas at the time and Brewster sold 200,000 kaleidoscopes in three months. <laughs> so he made himself a pretty small fortune out of this, and not so much out of his other uh, experiments. But the chap that did take some notice of him was another very, very interesting person called James Chance. His father and his uncle had a small glassworks near Birmingham. And uh, this young man was very bright at school and he was sent to Cambridge where he studied divinity, 
He studied law. Um, he did a little bit of science on the side because that was the rule at Cambridge, which was a scientific university. And when he had completed all his courses and come up with first class honours, he had to decide what he was going to do. Should he go into the army, the navy, the church, or the law? Well, he decided not to do any of these things but to go into business, which was considered a terrible disgrace. How can a man that's done while he's here at Cambridge go into this nasty job? Business is still a bit of a new box, is that you don't speak to people like that. It's not a profession. Off he went back to his uh, family firm where he put his scientific bed to good use and he discovered a way to make large sheets of plate glass in great numbers. Up to that stage, you could only make, well, a piece of glass about that big flat. And so all the, 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 the windows in those days were leaded like because they were, that was the maximum size of a piece of flat glass you could make. But he could make a piece of glass about a meter by a meter or even bigger uh, very quickly in terms of dark and mass production. Um, at this stage, he got in touch, or vice versa, with another of these incredible people who were absolute geniuses. A chap called Joseph Paxton, who was a, a garden boy, so to speak, discovered by the Duke of Devonshire, talent noted, and he was said to be the, uh, the manager of the Duke's estate in Derbyshire, at Chatsworth House, where he started building all sorts of structures on the, on the property and improving it and bringing in exotic plants which needed hothouses to live in. He brought in the first bananas and the first pineapples to him. And the bananas that you eat today are all bananas that belonged to the, the Cavendish breed. Cavendish is the uh, family name of the Duke of Devonshire and uh, the bananas all came from the hothouses. How did he make the hothouses? Well, James Chance supplied him with large sheets of glass and he made these very big hothouses. And the Duke of Devonshire appreciated him more and more, and Chance got the, uh, 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 well, Paxton got the uh, job of serving on some of the railway boards along with the engineers of the day, um, making the, and organizing the railways that were springing up all over England. Well, at one of these meetings, Paxton meets Brunel and Stevenson and the top engineers of the day who've got a problem. Prince Albert has told them to build an enormous building on Hyde Park in a year and make it such that it can be dismantled in a hurry and removed without any trace. And Brunel and Stevenson, Robert Stevenson, the railway man, uh, decided that they, this, this beat them. They didn't know what to do. Until at one of these meetings, Paxton said to them, why don't you uh, build a jar of glass with cast iron ribbing, you can put it up in no time at all, uh, as big as you want to, it's repetitive, and I know the bloke who can supply the glass. So off they went to James Chance, who said, okay, you want 150,000 sheets of glass in about three months. I have to go over to France again and get a lot of Frenchmen to come and help with our factory, and the factory grew, and uh, in that time, at all, Charles Brothers were the largest glass makers in England. But James Chance wasn't risking it that on his trips to France, he'd noticed what Fresnel and company were doing with these dioptic lenses. He also went over to France to improve the quality of glass because we needed optical glass now and they were only making window glass. And he came back with new ideas on how to improve the quality of glass, which wasn't at that stage very good in England. And he then experimented and found out how to make the lenses and the dioptic uh, <coughs> lenses for lighthouses. And so his great effort 
at producing the glass resulted in the Crystal Palace, which was the home of the Great Exhibition of 1851. And um, it was an enormous success with 13,000 exhibitors from around the world, but mainly from England, showing <coughs> the brilliant things that England could do uh, in the, at, the, at the height of the Industrial Revolution now. And pride of place, because he was in at the ground floor, went to Sir James Chance, who displayed his prototype catadioptic lens for lighthouses. Because what he's done now, he's taken the, 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 the part which Fresnel and McKay have found, and he's got to put more lenses on the top here to reflect the light which would otherwise be wasted going upward here, reflect it back into the beam. And he's now got a very, very efficient light. Again, there's more lenses at the bottom here reflecting the light going downwards back into the beam. So he's got his catadioptic lens. One of the great parts of the great exhibition, people came from far and wide to admire this. And he's now got a better idea too, that you can put this on a pedestal and rotate the pedestal and arrange your, your, uh, your lenses here in such a fashion that you can now identify the lighthouse far better than it was before. And uh, this is what he produced, and he got all sorts of orders for it. Chance Brothers now are in the lighthouse business instead of just the producing the glass and they became the great lighthouse suppliers of the late 19th, the second half of the 19th century, uh, this part of the 20th century. I was hoping that Sir James's great grandson would be here today. Are you here, Mr. Toby Charles? No, unfortunately, he said he'd hoped to be here, but he is actually the Shadow Minister of Small Business Development in the institution down the road, so I suppose he's doing his legislative duties at the moment. Uh, Toby Charles, MP for, uh, well, not a consistency uh, anymore, but uh, just to live somewhere in Johannesburg. So we've now got these enormous, enormous arrays of lenses which are going up all over the world. This chap here, rotated on some sort of spindle with a thrust bearing down here somewhere and uh, weighed well, half a ton perhaps. This gentleman weighs about six tons. And if you want to have that going around on a uh, affair like this, you're going to be in trouble because the friction will be just too enormous to be able to happen, to be able to turn through a weight which descended slowly like clockwork. So, somebody at this stage said, okay, float the lenses on a bed of mercury. Then you'll have no friction at all. Uh, apart from the fact that the bed of mercury weighed another ton, uh, <laughs> it was the way to go forward with these great big um, lenses, which they now use for lighthouses, and still do, and the lights around the South African coast, most of them Rotate on a bed of mercury. So now you've got lighthouses that can have a, a, a decent lamp in them and uh, they can rotate and you can identify them very easily. And uh, on this frictionless bed, uh, you can get them to rotate very quickly too. So the, uh, the current is set set up very clear. Now, eventually, eventually, Faraday suggested that electricity was going to be the right thing for lighthouses uh, way back in the 1830s. But um, electricity didn't come really till, till the 1920s. But they were worried about the, uh, the fallibility of electric lights, so they always had two inside the, the, uh, the big lenses. So, over the years now, we've got mercury bath turntables, uh, mantles, and uh, off-center panel axes, which produce these group flashes to identify the lighthouse. 
So electricity first used unsuccessfully in 1862. Uh, we've got mains power, filament lamps in 1922. And now we've got modern sealed beam light sources from about 1961 onwards. And so with uh, electricity, with modern techniques, the need to have a lighthouse keeper to clean the lens and to fuel the fire and such like became unnecessary. And many of these tall lighthouses were converted into automatic operation uh, from the shore. And this did mean, however, that the lighthouse now had to be serviced once a week at least by somebody coming along in a helicopter and uh, checking if all was right. And this gave rise to another little bit of interesting civil engineering, because when you put a structure for the helicopter to land on top of a long tower like this, it creates all sorts of problems. How do you fix this thing on that it would take the weight of a helicopter? And of course you can't obscure the light at all. So um, they had to solve that problem and fix it somehow there. Then you've got another problem, that you've got a deck up the top here, and the deck thinks it's an aeroplane at the time it tries to take off. So uh, there's all sorts of problems with this. Uh, the decks tend to break away, and many of these decks now have sacrificial edges which allow the, uh, uh, the edge to break off when there's a bad wind and leaves enough for the helicopter to land and the to get up. <laughs> so, uh, in the 21st century, the lights are changing to sealed beam units with LED and illumination. Uh, they flash to a computer program, so there's no need for these revolving assemblies either. Soon, to the giant revolving optics and the mercury-based turntables will be museum pieces. But uh, will the lighthouses themselves survive? Modern GPS technology, revolutionized navigation, sophisticated radar, warns of hidden hazards. Do we need lighthouses? I, I think they are always going to be a need for a reliable backup. And so the kindly lights may no longer lead, but they're going to be around for some time yet. Thank you.